music is, is the universal language and, you know, fishing, I think also is just part of our kind of innate ability. We're kind of, we kind of want to gravitate to providing. Welcome back to the Remote No Pressure Podcast. How are you doing, Bill? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Good. Great to see the sun. Oh, it is. Spring is coming on. We are like a less than a month away from uh, springtime. If it was like 85 degrees and nothing on, no snow on the ground, and it was just beautiful, what would you do? Oh, man, I'd be out hiking or doing something on the water, kayaking. Yeah, yeah. I think Spend I would... Spend a couple nights in the woods. <laughs> I think I would just lay out in the sun with as minimum amount of clothes as I could possibly I have. I thought on. that's where you're going from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> just soak in sun and 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 just sunbathe. I'm, I just want to be hot. Yeah. You know, I just want to be warm. And I know probably some people are like, "Okay, come to Texas or whatever," but I just want to be warm at this time of the year. It might be nice down in the southern part of the, of the states this time of year, but like we got the best summers. I feel. We do have here. good summers, yeah. but you know what? I went back. My brother turned forty a couple of years back, mm-hmm. and I flew down to you know to celebrate his fortieth birthday. And it was August. His birthday is August the tenth, and I'm in Texas. Ugh. And I remember how hot it was because my mom lives just outside of Dallas, and it was like uh, probably 110 degrees. And we were on, we were in a Walmart, of course, Walmart parking lot, <laughs> 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 and that black top. You yep. know, it was like an oven, and I loved every second of it. Are you serious? Love it. I love humidity too. I just oh. like it. Oh, isn't that crazy? That is crazy. That's wild. Well, this this week on the Remote No Pressure podcast, we are starting out our musicians on the fly series. I'm super excited about that. Yeah. Who's your favorite musician, Bill? Oh, man. You always put me on the spot with these questions. <laughs> I got a lot of favorite musicians. I'm a big music fan. Yeah, you are a big music fan. Um, I mean, if we're talking like metal guitar, like I'd say Zach Wilde. I love Zach Wilde's guitar playing. Now, isn't that where you got the name Wild Bill? It is. It's, it is. Well, the spelling for it. Yeah, I was yeah. called Wild Bill since I was a kid, but <laughs> I stole the spelling from Zach Wilde. That's awesome. It's Ozzy's guitar player. If we're talking singers, I'd say like James Hetfield from Metallica, if we're talking metal still. Uh-huh. You know? But if we're talking like just general rock, like, oh, you got to go back to Led Zeppelin, man. Jimmy Page's guitar playing, Robert Plant's vocals. Now, you, people on the podcast can't see you right now, but your knees are moving. You can tell you're like, you're excited about yeah. this. I, I like music. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, went to school for music. Uh, yeah. Got a degree in music. Played guitar for a long time. Uh huh. That's mm-hmm. true. I, mm-hmm. yeah, you did. Holy cow. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I I've got a very a varied taste. Mm-hmm. You know, I I feel sorry for like um, Spotify because it's like rec- making recommendations, and it's probably like, what the heck should I recommend this guy? Because <laughs> I'm so like crazy. What was the first CD you ever bought? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, and it's, it's going to probably be embarrassing. That's okay. We're going back to the '90s, and like CDs uh, were out. Probably 80s or 90s. Yeah. And we grew up poor. We've talked about this before. Yeah. So I bought my first CD player in 1994. Okay. Was it a disc man? Like, no. Or this was, was like a boom box, like detachable Ooh. speakers, so I could have surround sound or <laughs> do whatever I wanted to do. Um, and so, and the first CD I bought with that was uh, Meatloaf Bad Out of Hell 2. That was a great album, though. That was a great album. That was a great choice. Yep. My first album was, I think, I think the dude played in a band. Because I grew up in a very religious home. Mm-hmm. and <laughs> All right. So I grew up in a very religious home, and my first album was a band called Striper. Oh, yeah. And I remember I, Striper. And I think it, I think this dude was a lead singer, a guy named Michael Sweet. Okay. And he put out an album, and, and I, I bought that CD. And I'm like, man, this is awesome. I thought that was really cool. There cool used album. to be some really good Christian music back in the day. Yeah. I mean, uh, that... <laughs> so... Remember Columbia House where you could get like... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did yep. you ever do that? I did BMG. You did? It just seemed like a better deal to me. Now, what was the deal? I don't remember. We're talking 20 years ago, man. Like 20 <laughs> CDs for a penny. No, that was like Columbia House. It was a penny deal. Yeah, where I where BMG was like, buy you know one, get 10 free or something like that. So you're spending money. I mean, <laughs> yeah, oh, and you yeah. got to pay shipping on the other ones for like twenty bucks a piece. For, right, right. And they get you. Yeah, it was. It was never a great deal, but I always loved the catalogs. <laughs> like just looking at the artwork. Yes. 
Artwork. Yeah. That's something that's a lost, a lost thing, art. Today. Yes. Artwork is a lost art. Do you ever sure. look at like vinyl albums, like actual open up and see the artwork like inside before, yes. you know, before like the CD covers that would unfold or the tapes that would unfold? Like, yeah, it was just, it was just something else. It was man. something. It was, yeah. it was a thing. It was art. You put work into it, you know? Right, right. It's, it's gone now. That's crazy. I, yeah, it's, it's a different world because we stream everything. We don't, yep. we don't hold things. And I'm guilty of that too. Yeah. And I don't know lyrics as well. Cause you said look in a CD cover and like see the lyrics. I know. I no, Google you them. Don't. Or yeah. you, you get, you got to get on YouTube and watch the lyric videos, you know? <laughs> Those are, we had a kid. See, I grew up in Texas, south of Texas, south of Houston, a town called Lake Jackson. And actually we had, um, it was actually built by Dow Chemical. Dow Chemical built our town. Which is kind of weird, I know, but, yeah. um, and so we had everyone there is either from Texas or from Michigan, uh, Midland, Midland, Michigan. Yeah, is I was going to say I thought Dow was out of Michigan. That's they are, so they have okay. a huge plant in Freeport, Texas, which is right outside of Lake Jackson. So they built this little town, uh, basically for Dow Chemical for its okay. employees. Okay, and so it wasn't uncommon to have someone there from Michigan, like a Michigan accent and people's there, people there, their, their accents aren't as thick as say like South Texas or, you know, on um, East deep, deep East Texas. So, um, it was pretty normal. That's why I don't have a really bad accent, but, um, we had this kid moving down the street by the name of Mark Miller, Mark, Mark Miller. He <laughs> moved there from Chicago. And I was thinking about this today because I went, I, I miss Mark. He was my best friend as a kid. And and I remember he moved down from Chicago and it was such a novelty. And we would get his mom mad just so she'd start yelling at him. And he, <laughs> and she'd be like, Mark, Mark, you get in this house right now, Mark. You know, and it was like it was like the Chicago Bears, you know, that whole time with SNL with Dub Bears. Bears. Right. And yep. all that stuff. Like and, and the Blues Brothers with, you know, yep. like speaking of music, that was a huge thing. So the Blues Brothers. And so we had Mark Miller down the road from our house and he was hardcore, like into like really hardcore metal. Yep. Like really hardcore. His parents did not care what he listened to, anything like wow. that. Wow. So what we did is <laughs> is um me and my buddy Josh. We were in the library after school, and we were flipping through this magazine, and there was a Columbia House Records like ad. So we ordered him like all the country CDs we possibly could, (laughs) (laughs) and sent them to his house. Oh man! So one day we go over there and I knock on his door, and his mom's like, "Matt can't play today," and I was like. (laughs) I was like, well, why not? And he's grounded. So he comes out. He's like, I'm effing grounded because he could cuss in front of his yeah. parents. He's like, I'm effing grounded. And I was like, what happened? He's like, somebody sent a bunch of country CDs to my house. My mom's pissed. <laughs> <laughs> and they weren't like, like, like. <laughs> Wait, were they pissed that somebody shipped him there or that it was country? No, I think that he. he his mom thought he enrolled in something. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, "Ma, don't listen to this stuff." <laughs> I remember just his mom was so pissed, and uh, and we we finally told him he was so mad at us, but it was it was hilarious. He got because he was a hardcore metal guy, and we didn't order like like new age country. We ordered like the old horrible like the outlaw country, the outlaw country yeah. that you only like. Yep. I say horrible, I love it, but. You know, compared to Pantera, you're not going to be into Willie Nelson or like the old stuff. Actually, uh, Pantera when they broke up in the early 2000s, uh-huh. and, uh huh. And who was that guy's name? David Allen Coe. You remember him? Oh yeah, yeah. He did an album with the guitar player from Pantera, like a hardcore metal album. Really? Yep. A very racist album. <laughs> 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 oh man that's awful he was a big metal head too though i mean like he wasn't like screaming or nothing but like uh-huh. you got these big metal riffs with his his country draw over it you know and that's something it was it, and there's i don't think there is an artist alive that has not played with willie nelson yeah if you look him up his his amount of work is so big he's saying with everybody he's yep. a, he's a texan mm-hmm. you know and no, he's not on the podcast. Well, he's uh, not on the podcast today. He's a, he's in Austin. Uh, yeah, Austinite, right? Yeah, he's, he's yeah. based out of Austin. But today we have another Texan, Old G. He goes by not Old G or O G, but Old G. 
Uh, his name, Grant Broderick, and he's out of Dallas, Texas. He's a musician awesome. who's also um, a sightline provisioner with Sightline Provisions. He's uh, one. Of, he's a rep for them and then a couple other companies as well. So I was very excited to have him on. So he's going to hang out with us. Cool interview. We're going to hear some of a couple of his tunes. And Awesome. Yeah, so welcome to the podcast. Let's, let's light the fire. Well, today on the Remote No Pressure podcast, I'm super excited to have Grant Broderick on the podcast. Thanks for joining us, Grant. Absolutely, Jeff. Thanks for having me. And did I pronounce that name right? It's Broderick, right? Yeah. Yeah, correct. Correct. Yeah, Broderick. There, there you go. And now, you have a different stage name, or is your Instagram, it's old G. Do you go by something else with, uh, with the music side? Yes. So, uh, my name is kind of hard. To, my last name is kind of hard to pronounce. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, a lot of people, a lot of my friends and family just call me G. <laughs> and so... Um, I couldn't just go by G with a stage name. So I kind of was thinking of a way to, uh, you know, have something along the, the lines of G and I just figured old G is a pretty good, it's kind of a play on the, uh, the OG, uh-huh, uh, right. <laughs> ori- original, original gangs. You're kind of funny and just, you know, it kind of sticks. It's easier to remember than, you know, my full name. So. Right, right, right. Well, that's great. Yeah. And, and we'll put those links up to your Instagram. But um, one cool. of the things I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is we're doing a series here on the Remote No Pressure podcast on musicians that are also fly anglers as well. And that's the reason, one of the main reasons I, I, um, I reached out to you. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of your career in both. Um, now, you were in insurance, right, for a while? Yes, sir. Um, did that um, out of college for about five years. And um you know, it was, it was a great living. I was making really good money at a young age, um, and it taught me a lot about the business world. But, you know, being an outdoorsy type person, I was spending uh, way too much time inside. Mm-hmm. Um, and even though I was making a lot of money, I didn't really have a lot of time to spend that or enjoy that money. Um, so after doing that about five years, I uh, was kind of ready for a change and just decided that uh, – I jumped full time uh, into music. Oh wow! Now, where did where did you go to college? If you don't mind me asking you, Grant. Yes. Uh, so um, I went to Fort Lewis College, it's a liberal arts college in Durango, Colorado. Uh huh. Um, and you know, Durango, the southernmost, you know, kind of southwestern part of Colorado. It's a beautiful country. Uh huh. Um, I was never really a huge, even, you know, grade school, elementary, high school. I just never was really a schooling person. I just didn't like school. Um, I love to learn, but I didn't like learning about stuff that didn't really interest me. Um, so, you know, there after high school, I was kind of in limbo in between kind of choices. So uh, I'm Native American. I'm Choctaw. So I had, um, through that, I had a scholarship, um, to uh, a bunch of different schools and I was also still playing golf at that time and I uh, chose Fort Lewis. Um, uh, my, my grandparents used to live in Silverton, uh, Colorado, so I had some ties to that area and just was kind of exploring myself and wanted to get out of Texas for a little bit and so that was kind of the, the first option that really seemed to fit and you know being a, a fly fisherman for you know a long ways going back the Animus River runs right through Durango. Um, so it kind of just aligned, uh, and it seemed like a good place to go. So that's where I went. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. Great. Now, is that near URA, Colorado? Uh, yeah, it's not. I mean, uh, URA, I believe, is a little bit closer up to uh, Denver, I want to say. I'm not absolutely sure on that. Okay. But it's kind of it's, – it's, uh, Durango's right. It's um, – in the San Juan National Preserve, and it's, mm-hmm. I mean, it's pretty much, you know, leaned up against New Mexico. So it's right there in the bottom southwestern corner. And I do believe your A is around there. I forget now exactly where that is, but there's a lot of good, you know, um, places right right in that area. That is good for fishing, outdoor activities, you know, just a lot of outdoorsy stuff up there. Yeah, yeah. I went to the San Juan Mountain Range when I was 10. My parents were going through a divorce, and it was – my dad and my brother and I, we went on a guy's trip out there, and I will never forget how beautiful 
it was. You know, even at ten years old, you you just every every minute you feel like you're in a postcard somewhere. You know, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so let me let me ask you this: what we, now on your bio, you were saying that you've been you've been fishing for as long as you could walk. Um, but when when did you start fly fishing? When did that kind of take over? Um, so I picked up, I actually purchased my first, uh, fly rod. I bought two rods. I bought a five weight and an eight weight with money that I had saved. Um, uh, I'll never forget it was a little town up here, uh, at the suburbs of Dallas called Plano, uh, at this big outdoor store called Jumbo Sports. And I always used to go in there and look and, you know, I was kind of more of a conventional fisherman when I was younger. Obviously that's how most people start. And, you know, I, I would wake up in the mornings on Saturday and just, you know, couldn't wait to see Walker's K Chronicles and, you know, the <laughs> Spanish fly, these fishing shows that just intrigued me. And so that was kind of the initial, how I was kind of introduced into fly fishing was through those, those avenues. Um, and, you know, just kind of saved up some money, bought a rod, bought two rods and, um, started practicing in my front yard and, you know, taking it down to the Creek there by my house and catching panfish and bass and kind of learning. Uh, I think, you know, as anglers, you're always kind of looking for something new. Uh, and that just always fishing has always just kind of excited me. And every time you go out, it's something new. So that fly fishing was just kind of that next step as I was getting a little bit older and kind of growing. That's really amazing. Now, um, I, I don't know if you know this, but I'm, I'm a native Texan. I live in okay. Michigan now, and I don't sound like I've ever been to Texas. My, my accent's so nasally. But I am born <laughs> and raised down there, and I went to uh, college there in uh, Oak Cliff, Texas. Okay, yeah. 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 And, um, and I'm not going to say the name of the school, but I, do you know Paul Torres? By any chance? Paul Torres. Yeah, he's man. He, that name sounds familiar. He's out a he's he's a guide out in the hill country there, and he he knows a lot of those guys that have been on the show. But him and I went to the okay. Harvard of of uh, of schools of colleges there on Keist and thirty five. But I ended up going to Dallas Baptist University as well, which is up the road off Keist Boulevard. But you know, there's not a lot of places to to fish in the city of Dallas. So where did you where did you go to do this fly fishing? Were you going down to Tyler? I mean, where where were you going exactly, Grant? No, so uh, where I grew up is kind of North Dallas. Um, okay. And there's uh you know uh, there's little creeks um, and and there's a lot of golf courses around that area where I grew up. Like so tro- like Trophy just, Club, like Trophy Club area, North Richland Hills. No, is that kind of where you were at? Um, kind of more uh i don't know if you ever heard of bent tree west or preston trail preston wood country club all these kind of glen eagles yeah um, yeah 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 all these country clubs right there in the north dallas kind of where the toll road hits george bush okay um in that area so there's also uh white rock creek which runs you know all the way up from you know little elm all the way down to white rock lake where i currently live now uh-huh. Um, and then eventually it runs down into the Trinity. So a lot of people think, you know, you're stuck in a big city. There's nowhere to fish. Well, right. that's not, ne- that's not necessarily true. Anywhere yeah. that there's normally water, uh, there are going to be, you know, uh, sunfish and bass and catfish and all, all your normal kind of native species. Um, I still get all the time, you know, I fish white rock, uh, periodically cause I live right here when the conditions are right. But, you know, you, you'll see people on the bank looking at me like, what is this dude doing out here? Because I'm in my, my skiff, uh-huh. you know, my pulling <laughs> skiff out there on a white rock. And they're like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> you know? And then uh, and then they'll see me catch one. They'll be like, my goodness, are they fishing here? I'm like, of course they're fishing here. You know? Uh-huh. I mean, there's, you know, and the, the cool thing about white rock here is they're just, you know, there's some very good sized bass. And most of them are native uh, Texas largemouth. So they have a smaller mouth mm-hmm. and more of a foot sh- football shaped body and they're mean. They're really aggressive. Wow. So, you know, when I was young, uh, literally at the end of my street uh, was a little creek system and there was a little bridge and I would just go down there underneath the bridge and it got a little deeper because I guess when they were building the bridge, they kind of had to dig it out. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, the sun, the green sunfish and a uh, little brim and stuff would make beds and you could just sight cast them. Wow. Um, and, oh, yeah. And they would take a little, you know, a little popper or a little spider fly or just anything. And it was just so fun. Um, and then, you know, I started, uh, I'd always spend time uh, up in Missouri and in Oklahoma. Uh, on my dad's side, they, they lived in Oklahoma. And on my mom's side, they lived in Missouri out and, you know, kind of in the sticks. And I had cousins and we would all just kind of, you know, spend a lot of time outdoors uh, in the summers and stuff. So I learned a lot through them as well. Now, where at in, in Oklahoma were you? So uh, my dad's family uh, near Hugo, and there's not a lot of great, uh, you know, fly fishing destinations there. Hugo's right on the border of Texas and Oklahoma. It's kind of near Paris, Texas. Okay. Um, uh, but it's not, it's not, you know, your, your lower mountain fork, your beaver's den style of, you know, trout fisher or anything like that. Now, when I would go up into Missouri, uh, there was more opportunities to kind of do uh, some trout fishing near the Ozarks and stuff like that. So luckily my, um, my uncle, was a you know very big hunter fisherman um and so they had all these poles and extra stuff and he would always be out doing stuff so he kind of helped me blossom as well as well as you know my dad and my grandpa um my dad is not a huge outdoorsman he's more of you know your business type guy uh, but he would always spend time and take me places and, you know, share that time in the outdoors. Even if he wasn't fishing, he'd just go with me and take me, which I always thought was very cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. So so you've been fishing your whole life. You, you transitioned into fly fishing. Now, what what got you to pick up your guitar? Now, do you play, is it dobro? Is that what your main instrument is? Or Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a variation of a dobro, essentially. So uh, it's called a Weisenborn. Uh, and it's basically just an acoustic lap steel, uh, which is pretty much what a dobro is. Uh, the, the only difference is the dobros have a metal cone, uh, which gives it that real pingy kind of folky, you know, bluegrassy kind of sound, country western kind of sound. And uh, a Weisenborn, unlike your normal guitar, where the the neck of the guitar is made out of, of a solid piece of wood, the Weisenborn is actually a resonance chamber that goes all the way up to the tuning pegs. Mm. So you can't fret it like a normal guitar. You have to play it with a slide. Um, and you get these very deep tones and kind of, uh, very, it almost sings. Uh, and it's a very technical instrument. If you're, you know, you have to be very spot on with your slide and your technique, your picking hand and your slide. Otherwise, the tone goes out the window very quickly. Um, so, you know, I'd always been a fan of that style of music and, you know, Ben Harper is a huge influence on me and he's a, an amazing slide player and just all the different, you know, Jackson Brown, I grew up listening to him and his slide player, David Lindley is a wise and born player. Um, and we're just always kind of drawn to that, to the sound of the slide guitar. Um, and when I first started playing gigs out, I just played an acoustic guitar and I would get this, you know, kind of, you sound like Jack Johnson, which he was kind of blowing up a lot around the same time that I was trying to make my moves, which was cool. I thought it was a compliment, but I didn't really necessarily want to sound like Jack Johnson. So Mm -hmm. I started putting more focus into, uh, the slide guitar and that's really become, um, an instrument that I'm kind of known for. And it's not an instrument that you see very often. They're, right. they're very rare. Um, you'll see them, you know, um, on the West coast, you'll see them in Hawaii, that typical Hawaiian slide, the iconic slide. It's kind of the sound that, you know, uh, can come out of the wide one, but you can also do a lot of different things with it. Uh, so it's, it's been a very cool journey. So did you, you did you start out on that that instrument or did you start out on the just traditional guitar? No, yeah, I started uh, kind of the typical way, uh, just an acoustic guitar. Um, you know, my mom's a very accomplished, talented uh, piano player, musician. She sings, 
and her, you know, my aunt is a country western style uh, singer as well. So I was always around music when I was younger, and uh, my sister actually uh, had a guitar, and she wasn't really playing it at the time. So I just kind of started, you know, messing around with it and uh, kind of started learning to harmonize and learn chords and do that kind of stuff. And kind of quickly realized that I could, you know, had the potential to maybe sing a little bit. So I just started kind of experimenting and trying to learn songs and it, it just kind of blossomed from there. But you know, I didn't start playing um, guitar until I was about 14. Oh, wow. Well, so the the life that you have, Grant. I mean, you have this fly fishing world, where you're you know you're a pro visioner with um, sightline provisions. I mean, you rep a lot of different companies, but you also have this musical side as well. Does it feel like they are two different worlds, or or do you feel like it's all one? Like, do you feel like you've segmented the two? Like, this is this is old G, the musician, and this is Grant, the fisherman. Or when you live your life, every day when you wake up, is it like a wholeness? Like, everything together, you fish, it, it, it kind of complements each other, you know, because we've talked to some great artists, some some artists that paint. You know, we, we've had a lot of painters on here. Uh, Paul Puckett, we've right. had Bob White. We've had some unbelievable people. A.D. Maddox, some of these legends, you know, these artists that paint and paint and paint. But I'm like, hey, there's a lot of other artists out there that play music, you know, that maybe they they don't get the, the same recognition as like a, a Bob White or a painter because that, you know, that's – there's this new generation of fly anglers coming up, you know, and – it's exciting right. to see. And do you feel like those two worlds, like you're a better musician when you fly fish more and you're a better fly angler when you play music more? Do you see those two lives kind of coming together? Absolutely. I think that there's a, a great balance. Um, and, you know, music is, is the universal language. And, you know, fishing, I think, also is just part of our kind of innate um, – abilities we're kind of we kind of want to gravitate to providing um and you know what i what i see very cool about it is i'm doing two of the things that i really love to do uh and i have a passion for and sometimes when you pigeonhole yourself into one thing you can easily get burned out right. and so you know what i've found with having this balance is that you know on the weekends uh when everybody else is normally playing and having a good time or maybe going fishing at the lake, I'm working, you know, I'm playing gigs and doing my music thing and being in the city and around a lot of people and, you know, constant movement. And then during the week when everybody goes back to work, you know, I have this, the down, my downtime, which right. is my freedom to, to go out on the lake when there's not as much pressure and kind of be, in nature and kind of rejuvenate, so to speak, and be still and quiet and, you know, have a good time, uh, either with friends or by myself, me and my dog or, and so, you know, it's really a good balance to life to have both of these things and two things that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, I think if it, if it was just full time, one or the other all the time, I might get burned out on it. And it's not something that I would, you know, want to pursue continuously. It totally makes sense. Um, I want to ask you, I want to, I would like to play a couple clips, obviously with your permission from, from your song, sure. from your, yeah. your music. Um, first one is river wild and that's an instrumental piece, right? That's no, there's no lyrics on that, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's a, that's a wise and that's an original wise and born piece. Um, and that song is, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of weird how songs just kind of come to you. Um, and you know, you're always trying to think of this name and the way that song just kind of moves, it just kind of reminded me of, of a river that, you know, that's wild. And, and sometimes it'll be a little bit slower and then it kind of picks up and then, you know, it's always pushing forward and moving. Um, so yeah, it's just an instrumental wise and born piece that, uh, that I've had now for about, I guess that song is about seven or eight years old. Uh, but just one I really enjoy and I'm, I'm very proud of. Well, let's listen to a clip right now. Awesome.
well, that was great. That was a great song. Um, I wanted to talk about Live Your Life. And that one, actually, you are, is it you that's singing on that? Yeah, I'm singing. Uh, I'm actually doing everything in that. Wow. Uh, uh, playing the hand percussion, um, doing the lead. Uh, there's there's a bass line in there that you can't really hear too well, but it's there. Um, and that was kind of um, one of my... That's probably one of my most uh, iconic songs as an artist that people kind of know. Um, but it's, you know, it's just a really easy kind of, uh, it's just, you know, a story about how you should live your life. And uh, uh, it's kind of got that islandy feel, which is a lot of, um, you know, what I, my style of music that I say is roots rock reggae. So it's, that's more of that reggae style where, uh, River Wild would be more of the root style or the folky kind of blues stuff, uh, or an instrumental like it is. Um, but it's just a, you know, it's a, it's an easy song to listen to, live your life, and it's kind of the mantra that I try to live by. Um, and you know, it's just good vibes. Why do you think it resonates with people that song versus some of the other songs you've written? You know, there's kind of there's one part that's. Uh, it's O E O E O our lives to each other. So it's kind of like this chant mm. and you know, it's something that I, that I really believe in that we, we do owe our lives to each other. Um, and it's not that, you know, I'm going to give you everything that I own, but we need to work together. And, you know, we're here on this, you know, this planet, uh, you, you know, as a whole, so we should help each other when we can. And, you know, learn from each other and not be so, you know, as you see more and more these days divided. Um, so it's just kind of that, that vibe and the, the, uh, it's okay to be brothers and sisters and humble and move, move together, you know? Well, let's take a listen to this clip. Remember how to live, remember how to give and never look down unless you open them up. Leave your life with a half full cup. I said, oh, we owe, we owe, we owe, oh, we owe, we owe our lives to each other. Ba-da-bam, ba-da-bam, ba-da-da-da, ba-da-da-dam, da-da-da-da. Coming a tide, always moving forward, surfers catching a ride, mother. Now, um, as far as, as inspiration, I mean, do you, do you find that a lot of times when you're on the water, do you get ideas for songs out there? Is it very inspirational time when you're out there on the water? Do you ever have you ever had any songs come to you? Absolutely. Um, and you know, that's what's great about you know, having an iPhone now is you got your notepad right there. Right. right. Uh, used to, used to, I'd carry, I would actually carry around a small, you know, uh, piece of pen and paper or pad and paper just in case ideas pop up or like sometimes I'll just be, when I'm out there playing, I won't have any music. I'll kind of be quiet and kind of be listening and I'll see something. It'll kind of spark something. And I'll just kind of start humming a little tune and then words will come out. And it's funny when, when inspiration hits, it normally hits very quickly and you kind of want to jot that stuff down, uh, especially as a, as a wordsmith or a songwriter, mm -hmm. because maybe the cadence, the cadence of your words coming out or, uh, you know, just the lyrics that you say can be so in the moment that if you, if you let that go, it's not the same when you go back and try to revisit it. Right. Um, and so it's, it's always good to catch those, but yeah, inspiration comes, can come at any time. And it's, it's funny though, you know, I always kind of think of, you know, I'm just kind of the messenger, you know, I don't really know when they're going to come to me. Uh, I'm just kind of, the, you know, the channel. Um, <laughs> and so when they come, you just let them go. Sometimes a song will take a year to write a lyrical song. Sometimes it'll take literally five minutes. So, I mean, it just, it just depends on, you know, your mood and what's happening around you. And I always try to be a sponge and absorb as much as I can, but definitely, I think a lot of my 
songs are just they're kind of nature oriented i'm you know i'm a nature kid man and i i'm proud of that and love being in the outdoors and witnessing all of all that we're blessed to see um in the, in the outdoors here in the united states and elsewhere um so yeah i mean definitely inspiration comes and you got to be ready for it because <laughs> uh, sometimes you know you don't want to miss those those quick little uh inspirations that come and something that comes out of that as well yeah i'm i love um texas swing so like bob wills and the texas playboys yeah and then um, um and i love those guys and and then like um um oh gosh hank williams the original you know hank williams senior you know so I was, yeah I was either reading something or watching a documentary about him, and he was saying he would he would actually read Harlequin novels to like give him the inspiration yeah. for Heartbreak. And yeah, I, I'm absolutely. Like, I'm like, what? So if you don't have enough <laughs> heartache, you can actually outsource it by purchasing one of these like <laughs> Harlequin novels, you know. And you feel, and there are times when I've read books, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. Or if you miss a big fish, that could be a lot of heartache, but. You know, oh, yeah. it, you know, just, you know, how he got these different sources of, of inspiration, you know, like you were saying, it could come from anywhere and he would, he would carry around these, these dumb books and read them. And that's, <laughs> that was that grief, you know, that he would, that he would write these songs. It's really cool. Yeah. I always wondered how they, how they get so sad. So that makes sense. A lot of sense. Some of those songs are just, they're too sad, you know, like nobody <laughs> can be that sad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it was good stuff, you know. Like I think it resonated with people, and I think that does. And um, I think it was Malcolm Gladwell was talking about songwriters, and like uh, if you want to write a sad country song that really makes it, like number one, you can't be anywhere north of like I think it was like Missouri, and you had to be like from the <laughs> south, like from Texas, Mississippi, Alabama. And he went through there. Uh, it was what is the name of that? As the, uh, the book was called Outliers, and he went through okay. like what were the best songs ever written, you know? And so um, it was actually really, really happy songs that really did really well. And then he listed yeah. if you were born outside of the South, with just a couple of a couple of exceptions through history, if you were born outside of the South or the Southwest, you know, as far as Texas, you cannot write a really sad country song and make it to number one. <laughs> That's interesting. But, uh, you know, I think uh, a lot of our nature is, you know, most people want to hear happy, uplifting stuff, but there's also, there's, again, going back to the balance word, you know, we're not happy all the time. You know, it comes in waves. So it's, right. it's kind of, you know, it can be good to have those songs that are a little bit slower and kind of more, you know, real and pull on the heartstrings a little bit. What's that one song, not your own song, but what's that, that go-to song for you whenever you just need to pour yourself a shot? Man, I have quite a few. Um, <laughs> Let's start with <yeah>. three. <laughs> so um, I would probably say, um, let's do kind of different genres here. There's, I've been on this big Gregory <laughs> Allen Isikoff. I don't know if you're familiar with him, Kick, here recently. Okay. Um, and there's a song, uh, Idaho is the actual name of it. Uh, that's really, it's kind of a haunting song. Uh, very easy to listen to. Um, that's definitely one. Um, you know, obviously you've got your, uh, your kind of, your older, uh, well, not really older, but your classic country, which, you know, your George Strait run, you know, is a great song. Um, oh, that's so good. That's, did you hear yeah, Taylor Swift? Did, did you hear Taylor Swift's version of that? I have not. Did, I have you, not heard you, that version. Okay, I know that's like you want to hear Taylor Swift sing George Strait. I know there's a lot of people in Texas <laughs> cringing right now, but she no, did. A, yeah. She did a great job. I was really surprised. I bet she did. Oh, you got to look know, a it lot up. Of people, I definitely will. Yeah, a lot of people give, you know. Oh, you listen to Taylor Swift. It's like, come on, man. Like she's obviously very talented or she wouldn't have made it as far as she has. So, you know, I try to respect all artists and at least give right. them a chance. You know what I mean? Right. And, and I, I've, I've mentioned her on the podcast before. I happen to be a pretty big fan of her. Now <laughs> I, I don't listen to like the teeny bopper stuff, but, uh, yeah. Ryan Adams covered her entire album, 19, uh, 1984. No, no. Was it 1984? Her album, but he, Ryan Adams covered the whole thing. 
And wow. dude, I don't know if you're Ryan Adams fan or not. Talk about pulling your heartstrings. Yeah, absolutely. But check out yeah. his version. So he took her album and he made the whole thing. And I've always heard like a great song is a great song when you can, when different people can play it and it's still a great song. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So you take, you, whenever you get off the horn with me tonight, get look up Ryan Adams, 1984. And when he does Welcome to New York, I'm like, holy cow, that's such a great song. And like, okay, you, you know, this is neat, Taylor Swift. But when Ryan Adams does it, dude, it just rips my heart out, you know? But anyways, yeah. all right, so we got two. What's no. number What's number three? So, I mean, another one that kind of pulls on, I was trying to think, um, a good one that pulls is, you know, uh, I'm a huge Ben Harper guy. Okay. Um, always, always have been. And, I mean, I'm trying to think of the perfect one. Um that really pulls on the heartstrings, but you know, like waiting on an angel from Ben Harper is a great song. One of the, really the first straight acoustic songs, um, that I, that I really kind of got down and learned. Um, and that's, you know, just kind of, it can be taken in so many different ways. Are you waiting on the love of your life? Are you waiting for the angel to come and take you to heaven kind of deal? But it's, you know, it's one of those songs that really just pulls on you and makes you think, um, and I think some of those sadder songs, or that's what you know they're meant for, is to really kind of, really get deep and make you think about your life and what's happening in the current state of affairs and in your in your journey. What what are the, what's the if you could name a couple of songs that you put in your truck when you're uh, when you're driving down 35 or wherever some far market road and you're just like excited about life? What are the two songs you like to listen to the most? Man, so. Um, Normally, if it's a good time and we're getting moving, uh, my good friends, the Revivalists, uh, are always a good listen. Uh, whether it be, you know, uh, Fade Away or Wish I Knew You, they got a lot of good songs. Their catalog, pretty much, uh, you could put on anything that you of their catalog and you're going to have a, a good listen to it. Um, and then another one here recently that I've really been enjoying, and it's kind of going back to the old, old style of music, but it is... Uh, is Coulter Wall. Um, and he's got a lot of cool songs. Uh, Devil Wears a Suit and Tie and uh, Sleeping on the Black Top. They're just good. Uh, to me, they're good traveling songs because they have a good rhythm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're kind of just moving forward at a good pace and it kind of just gets you in the mood. So, I mean, I could go on for days of, I of what I listen to. <laughs> I, listen, I listen to so much, so many different styles of music. Right. Too. I, uh, I try to really not ever be like, oh yeah, I don't listen to that. You know, I'll always, you know, at least give it a chance. And then if I don't like it, then we'll find something. But normally you can find something that you like in every genre. You know, I don't do mumble rap and stuff like that really, but right. um, most of your, your stuff that, you know, your acoustic genres, rock and roll, blues, R and B, hip hop, all that stuff, uh, even down to classical and, you know, instrumental stuff. I really enjoy a wide variety of different styles of music. Yeah, there's and, and you know what's so crazy? Like not only do you know, used to whenever I think of fly anglers, I think of like bluegrass, you know, or Right. Yeah. But like there's a lot of guys like when they're tying streamers, they want to listen to metal. You know, yeah. I mean, they're these yeah. they're, they're these flat bill tattoo guys that they're just like hardcore, and they're like, when I tie streamers, I want to listen to to <laughs> Anthrax, you know, and not every, <laughs> you know, it's like this really cool diverse, um, the diverse population, the people who fly fish that, you know, when they're at the Vice, they may they may listen to something completely different than I would, you know. I like absolutely, I like to listen to Green Sky Bluegrass. I love that band. There you go. And then yeah, great band. Yeah, and but like they may want to listen to Pantera and that's just the way it is, you know, or it depends on the type of flies they're tying. But, right. you know, it's really cool that you say that, you know, I think, uh, flying English are, are somewhat open-minded, especially the newer, the newer guys coming up. So what, what's next for you, Grant? I mean, you've got your music thing and you got your, your fly fishing thing. What's, what's kind of on the horizon for you, Grant? Um, so, you know, the next step here, um, and, you know, I just got this skiff, like I was talking about. I've had it now for a couple of months now and uh, want to get my captain's license and potentially start guiding, uh, not immediately, but in the near future. Um, 
and just experience, you know, teach people the great art of fly fishing here locally and that you don't have to be on a great trout stream um, to go out and have a good time fly fishing and be successful. Um, also, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge saltwater guy. So running down to the Texas Gulf, into Louisiana, down to Florida. Um, so I think that's going to be, you know, the next, um, 10 to 20 years of my life is honing in on these places and, and somewhat guiding. Now I stay pretty busy with the music and the repping. Um, so I'm not looking to guide full time. Uh, but I would definitely, you know, consider, you know, maybe four to five clients a month kind of deal or um, something of, along those lines, not, ex- you know, extremely, um, busy with guiding, but it's definitely something that I want to do. I love seeing people catching fish on a fly rod and reacting to it and being a part of the whole, um, scenario from start to finish. It's something that's very rewarding to me, even when I just go out with my friends, you know, and we're pulling around and they catch a big old fish. It's, it's great um, to share in the camaraderie. And you know, the other cool thing about my particular spot is that, you know, I could take you out guiding and then play you some music when we're done after dinner or something. You know what I mean? So it's, you can really, you can really work this thing in. Um, right which is something that, you know, I've kind of started to do with a lot of my fly shops that I deal with is when they have events, they'll call on me to come play music. That's awesome. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's bridging the gap between the two passions and, you know, music, the universal language and, you know, almost every fly fisherman that I've ever met listens to music. There's not really one that is <laughs> like, nah, I don't, I don't listen to music, you know? So it's cool to have that, have two things that people, you know, enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, in life and then I get to be a part of it. So it's very, very cool. That's awesome. Well, I could talk to you literally all night, Grant, because my two favorite things <laughs> are music and fly fishing. And um, and seeing those things come together is really awesome. If, if someone wanted to um, listen to your music, if someone wanted to get a hold of you, we're going to share those links uh, in the show notes and also uh, on our website. But if you want to just tell them, because a lot of people are driving down the road or whatever, where would they, where would they find you at, Grant? Yeah, so the, the easiest way to, is just to follow me on the social media platforms. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge proponent of live uh, music. I do have stuff on the interwebs that you can buy, and uh, I'll have another album coming out here in the near future, uh, hopefully by summertime this year, uh, which will be on all your outlets, your iTunes, Spotify, all that good stuff. But you, know, you catch me on uh, SoundCloud.com. Just look up my name, Grant Broderick, or you can follow me on Instagram at good old g it's good g o o d o l e g and then my music page is just good old g music so the good old g is the fishing page the good old g music is the music page well that's awesome well thank you very much grant good luck with everything and we just appreciate you taking some time with us absolutely jeff thanks for having me and good luck with the podcast i enjoy listening to it all the time all right thank you sir you got it Well, thank you, Grant, and thank you for joining us on another episode, another week, the Remote No Pressure podcast. You know, I, I just look back over the last two years. Believe it or not, we've been on the air for two years now, and I just can't believe where we've come. We're growing so quickly, and it's just, like, so fun. It's so amazing just to, to meet new people and, and just to see this thing grow, and, and none of that would be possible without you guys. Thank you so much. And it's episodes like this with Grant and, and the artist and the people that I get to meet. It just it energizes me. And I love art. I love music. I love to see how fly fishing has done so much for so many people, either through recovery or it's just amazing just to see what this sport and the outdoors could do for people. Two dates I want you to put on your calendar. Number, number one, the first date is March the 2nd. If you are in the West Michigan area, the fly fishing film tour will be in Grand Rapids. Very excited about that. Um, And I will be at Elk Brewing on Wealthy Street. I think it's the tap room there. Elk Brewing on Wealthy Street at 6 o'clock on March the 2nd. It's two hours before the 8 o'clock showing of the Fly Fishing Film Tour. We'd love to see you there. I don't know if the space is going to be completely packed out or if there will be five people there. But either way, we're going to have a great time. The The other date I want you to, for everyone that listens out in Pittsburgh, we're actually going to be out in Pittsburgh while Bill and I... On April the 8th, we're going to be there in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with the Trout Unlimited chapter. 
We're very excited about that. Um, be sure to check out our website, follow us on social, and until next time, go fishing.